Neil, you seem to have a huge focus on improving people's lives in a very health-centered way, because as you say, it's very easy to measure. Yeah. What would you say to the argument, I'm not saying this is my point of view, but I'm saying what would you say to the argument that you are saving people for lives that won't necessarily be as fulfilling as if, for example, you're investing in education or if you're investing in giving them a better life while they live? Yeah. Um, that's a, it's a great question, and it's something that, that we think a lot. Uh, fortunately, we have a very easy get-out clause, uh, which is that SCI also happens to be, uh, oh, and funding deworming, also happens to be uh, possibly the cheapest way in the world to improve uh, a child's education. Um, the children in these areas end up uh, skipping a whole lot of school because of the, uh, the diseases that they have, um, and so this is actually one of the cheapest ways to boost school attendance. Um, and so you don't have to have just one, you don't have to just, just uh, improve someone's health or quality of life. You can also improve their education. It also improves their earning prospects um, into the future, uh, as well as their quality of life. So I, I think you want to go for both. Um, does, that, does that answer the question? I would also add that we are kind of looking at other sorts of interventions, yeah. as well as health. I mean, I think we started off on health because it's one of the easiest things to measure objectively. We do realize that perhaps things like um, political lobbying might be effective um, and all kinds of things and, and you know as we expand we're hoping to do more and more research in exactly. lots of different areas we, we realize we're not there yet and we're not wonderful as SCI is we're not claiming that we absolutely definitely know this is the one most cost-effective way to um, donate at the moment exactly um, we're, we're still looking into things and you know if you want to join us you can you can help us with that research anyone else yeah, yeah uh, my name is Aaron. I'm actually uh, the executive director of one of the charities you guys are looking at, results uh, here in the UK, doing the political lobbying piece. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I found really uh, helpful looking at the Good We Can website was the, you mentioned the Stop TV Partnership is one of your high impact interventions. It's, it's really great that you, you've recognized tuberculosis as one of those diseases that is uh, um, is currently very high uh, value for in terms of intervention. Just to mention, it's a uh, well, TV day this Saturday, so keep your eyes out in the newspapers for some, some stuff about that. Um, I guess my question as somebody that does that political lobbying piece for a li living um, and, and looking at how we can get our government to give, give better and to invest uh, in more in these interventions is specifically around DFID and um, the deworming initiatives. I mean, what sort of, if, if I can ask, uh, what sort of ballpark figure are you getting from DFID? Um, and I noticed that uh, you looked at the different countries you've got there, they're all different focus countries, the, the, the half dozen countries you've got there. Um, what plans do you have for going outside of the different area of focus? Are you talking to other governments that are, that are interested in yeah. non dodo countries? Yeah, there are, only, <coughs> there are only two governments which have uh, donated anything really to neglected tropical diseases, uh, the Americans and the British. And, uh, the one disease which the, uh, which the British have been supporting for 10 years is lymphatic filariasis, which is a really nasty disease. Um, in 2006, the American government, for the first time, gave money as a result of, there's a group of about five of us who've been lobbying, and they came up with $100 million over uh, five years, which was fantastic for us. But when you put it in perspective, at the same time, they announced $50 billion for HIV AIDS. And uh, TB is also quite well funded through the Global Fund. The British government then followed in 2008, you asked the figures, and donated £50 million, half of which came to us for schistosomiasis and intestinal helmets. Uh, 10 million went to uh, Liverpool for lymphatic filariasis. Uh, 5 million went to the African program for onchocerciasis control, and 10 million went for the eradication of guinea worm, uh, which is a particularly nasty worm, which is very close to being eradicated. On the 21st of January, uh, at about 6 o'clock in the morning, Stephen O'Brien, the minister, went on TV so that nobody could see him, and announced that they were going to increase the neglected tropical disease component from 50 million to 245 million. So they've added another 190 million uh, pounds sterling. Another 25 is supposed to come to us, uh, but we've actually got to go through a whole process of uh, making a good business case for it. 
And with that, we've promised them that we will increase the number of people we treat from 75, uh, the number of treatments we will deliver, sorry, not number of people, from 75 million to 150 million over the next five years, which is uh, 30 million a year. There are 200 million people a year infected with schistosomiasis, so we're, we're still underfunded. The American government have also uh, trebled the amount of money that they're giving. So we now have approximately half of what we need uh, to cover sub-Saharan Africa. Um, with the new money, we believe that uh, a significant amount is going to go to a new disease which the British government have never funded before, which is trachoma, a blinding eye disease. And they're increasing the amount of money for lymphatic filariasis. They've uh, met the Carter Center's uh, target for eradicate. They, they reckon they need $60 million to eradicate uh, guinea worm. We're down to the last 1,000 cases, most of which are in southern Sudan. Uh, but that, that should be dealt with. Uh, and then um, what the British government have decided to do is select two countries which are really badly affected by all the neglected tropical diseases. And they're going to try an integrated program in them using uh, the UK coalition, probably, uh, which is SCI and Liverpool, Sight Savers, and Carter Centre UK. And uh, these, th we're, we're going to work in a consortium so that we can try and improve the health, uh, in particular, uh, of, of the two s countries that they finally select. So basically, they have quadrupled the amount of money the British government. And actually, I'm not sure we could have expected anything like that. We're really very thrilled. Thank you. Um, I think probably time for one or two more questions, if there's anyone else. Yes? Do you intend going forward to measure the effectiveness, of the, the, the actual effect of the treatments that you're giving? Because I mean, charities are always very keen on telling us how much money they've raised, um, how many things they've delivered, what the things are. And I guess because the third one's hard, they never tell us what effect that's actually had. One of the, one of the good things about us is that we are in an academic institution. And for us to continue to survive in that institution, we have to publish. And all we can publish are the results of our, uh, what we've managed to do and the impact. And so we're, uh, we're very keen uh, and very careful to spend something like 10% of our money on monitoring and evaluation. So we, uh, we do baseline studies which tell us the prevalence and intensity of the infection. We measure heights and weights of children. And we particularly do anemia levels. One of the problems with these diseases is that um, they're all infect children, but the people die and are disfigured 15 years later. So the data we're collecting today, hopefully <clears throat> your child can do a PhD in 20 years time and prove just how effective I really was. Um, but unfortunately it can't be done very much quicker. But what we do measure is what we, what we know we can measure, which is heights and weights, as I say, um, and, and, and the incredible impact of deworming in, in children who apparently have no symptoms, and yet within a year they will rejoin the normal, uh, the normal height weight curve. And then in particular, you saw the blood in the urine, that disappears. Bladder cancer, which is a, a result of schistosomiasis, has completely disappeared from Egypt as a result of schistosomiasis being eliminated from there 10 years ago. And, and it was the elimination in Egypt which set us going and said, wow, if we can do it there, we can also do it in sub-Saharan Africa. So yes, we really do measure our impact and we do publish our work uh, in the peer-reviewed literature. I, I would also add that I get quite frustrated when I look on charity websites and they're sort of, they like showing off about how little they spend on administration, which can often include things like monitoring and evaluation. And I just wanted to say, I think it's very heartening to hear you saying, you spend 10% on that, and that's, and that's a good thing. I mean, I think of giving what we can, we'd encourage more and more charities to go that way. Yeah, indeed. We were quite surprised that, in fact, with the first money that we got from DFID, all they wanted to know was how many people we treated. Mm -hmm. But in the second money, uh, they are very keen now uh, to show impact. They're very much results dri driven so that the minister can get up in five years' time and not only say that we've treated 100 million people, but that we've actually set, 
use these dalis. We use dalis, not qualis. <laughs> Although qualis are better for us because our diseases don't really kill, and that's why they've been neglected for so long. One more question? Yeah. Um, this is a, I, I don't particularly know much about this In a bad recession in most developed countries, uh, where there are many, many jobless people, many people who are, are threatened with uh, lots of quality of life um, to a significant degree that may lead to extreme child poverty in countries which we wouldn't consider that to be a, a major manifest problem. Um, if there are people in the population who can afford to lose a third of their income or between 10 and the 10% and 15% of their income, would it not be morally correct for them to give up between 10 and 50% of their job, thus allowing somebody else to earn, when there is high unemployment? Um, also, because working fewer hours, I know, is something which will go up to the I'm not saying I particularly agree with it's but I think uh, it is a, an ethically difficult. It's a really interesting question. Um, there's lots of sort of angles to that. I mean, the, the, the New Economics Foundation has been doing quite a lot of work on the idea of a shorter working week and how a kind of combined both voluntary and, and regulatory-led kind of shift towards a, a, a lower average working week, um, in particular aimed at people who have you know, high incomes, um, could help both um, address issues around you know people being inordinately stressed working on jobs and having very long working weeks, but also the key point you're making about rebalancing work. There's all kinds of practical challenges around around doing that. I think you're always going to be relying more on an appeal to um, good sense and um, uh, you know, in the same way that uh, it's sort of similar to the question of how do you address inequality more generally? Is it better addressed through um, registered, ta registered taxation measures that kind of, you know, tax the rich more and, and reach a bit more or are there other ways of complementing that so um, some of the more equal countries you could argue um, have a, a, a sort of cultural ethos that encourages that sort of makes inequality seem less um, less acceptable so for example in Scandinavia Den Denmark and other countries often come out incredibly good on any kind of quality of life measures relatively low levels of inequality and in fact a very a kind of ethos around fairness which is part of their welfare state, part of their kind of uh, kind of attitude towards looking out for each other. So in, in there, again, they tend to have better, better, uh, more balanced working hours and therefore high levels of, therefore, but as well, high, high, or high levels of people in employment. But I don't think there's a particularly easy solution there around enforcing shorter working weeks. Um, but certainly, I mean, I think it, it, what, we, what we do need is, is appealing ideas that that not only do the right thing socially, but also have some appeal to them. And I think the idea that many people who, have, who are relatively privileged in the developed world are drawn to is the idea of having more time and better quality of life. And if there is an increasing recognition that giving and, and, and a more balanced life is actually more fulfilling life as well, then you know, that's kind of where we're coming from with this, which is actually, as well as policy change, you need people to recognise the stuff that actually most and so, I would add, yeah. I don't think it's an either or thing either. I mean, I, I started working part time about a year ago, and that was partly so I could do voluntary work with giving what we can and other organisations. And I think possibly one thing we'll be looking at in the future in giving what we can is um, effective ways of giving time. So, um, effective ways of doing voluntary work is yes. obviously yes. one option people can take um, if they're not working full time. Yes. Okay. I now, I wonder if I get to the issue, though, because, it, you know, like, like we showed, it, that putting um, half your income into the UK isn't going to do as much good as, as giving these organizations. So it seems like if you're willing to give half or 10% of your income to a cost-effective organization, there's no greater amount of good you can do with that, even if you're giving your job and your wage to, to someone in, in the UK, it seems like. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that as well. Okay, I think that wraps up the formal event. Um, it would be lovely if as many of you as possible could stay for a glass of wine or juice and some nibbles. And um, we and the speakers will hope to be around for a bit in case you want to ask any further questions. Thank you. Thank you.